kid. Seriously. Welcome to the wholesome version of the Kid Seriously Show. Only podcast around where we're together again. Wouldn't miss it. How we doing? Same as always. Every so often we get together to discuss news in the realm of Star Wars and other parts of the world that tickle our fancy. We're going to answer some questions that Kid Seriously got and review an episode from the Clone Wars series. After two or three weeks apart, we've done the math and remain steadfast that we are better united than divided. To my right, out on the sunny coast, soon to be of the rainy woods of Portland, it's Mark Neitzel. And to my left, please excuse my dear Aunt Sally, it is Luke Neitzel. Gentlemen, that's enough math for now. How are you? I'm good. The uh, The NFL started, and it's been a good oh, day God. so far because oh, uh, my Vikings won. But more exciting, after probably a 15 to 20 year absence from you know fantasy football i joined a survivor league which i'm very excited about you know you pick one team each week and if that team wins then you move on to the next week and you have to pick a different team so you can never use the same team I, twice i know how it works in well not everyone everyone necessarily yeah. does and uh, i picked the saints so it was a good run <laughs> that was fun can't wait to do it next year one and done mark how you doing man <laughs> I'm doing pretty good. How about you? Well, um, we are recording this on Sunday night, and uh, Rogers has been hurt, and Khalil Mack has been uh, acting as if he was personally offended by us not trading for him, and we're getting a crap kicked out of us by the Bears, so uh, not good. We're, yeah, we're good, though. We like the Vikings. Can we get to the News! News! Hey, I feel like it, the first half of the first season of this podcast was devoted almost entirely to The Last Jedi. Blu-ray sales have Ryan Johnson's quote-unquote masterpiece as the highest-selling movie of the year. And after its huge haul at the box office, um, all signs seem to be pointing really good. Uh, the director has now gotten backing for his upcoming movie. It's called Knives Out, and that's going to star Daniel Craig, and it's going to begin filming in November. We could talk about that movie, or his plans for his Star Wars movies, Quite frankly, I'm bored about talking about Ryan Johnson, so I'm going to force you two to talk about what I want to talk about, which is my second favorite movie of the year, a Star Wars movie way too high on my personal list, and which comes out on digital in just a few days. It's Solo, A Star Wars Story. Gentlemen, there's lots of Solo news out there, including the following tidbits. One, Ray Park was invited to come back as Darth Maul only after Ron Howard was brought on as director and continually spoiled his appearance on Instagram. Only people weren't paying a wholesale attention, and the ones that were assumed that it was for Obi-Wan anyways. The release is also going to include a close look at the Millennium Falcon, deleted scenes involving Han and Kira's escape from Corellia, um, what I'm most excited for, a feature focused entirely on Chewbacca. Guys, I think I know the answers to these following questions. I know neither of you are likely to get this movie, and I know that I will get it on di digital as soon as possible. I also know that I'll watch it probably four times a year, and that you will watch it in passing on TNT during holiday seasons. But does any of this news sound appealing to you? Did you even watch that movie, Mark? And do you think Ryan Johnson named his new movie after the Radiohead song? So hey, it is a solo movie? <laughs> It didn't do so well, it turns out. Yeah, I know. Right? May have derailed the whole franchise. I'm I'm not a big special features guy. I generally don't watch them or at, anymore. Um, I did when DVDs first came out, but of, of all the Blu-rays I have and I've bought recently, I generally don't watch the special features. That sounds like a good lineup. Um, other than deleted scenes, I guess I do watch deleted scenes. And most of the time when I watch a deleted scene, I go, yep, that makes sense you took that out. Uh, yeah, they really are downers. Yeah, yeah, they're usually gone for a reason. That's why I generally never buy or watch extended cuts of movies, because generally they are much worse than what came out in theaters. But, you know, as we talked about, this this movie was fine. I have nothing against it. I had an enjoyable time. I don't remember a ton from it after having watched it, because it wasn't one that, that really stuck with me or resonated with me. But I wouldn't tell anyone not to watch it, not to enjoy it, or not to buy it. Um... I, I think Ryan Johnson did name it after his Radiohead I, <laughs> song because uh, he's 
purposefully trying to ruin that song for you. Oh god! Because his whole here his, it goes. His whole, right. He's always his whole, my lucky charm. His whole career arc is based around trying to ruin things you specifically like, and 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 I'll let Mark answer. But you know, I, I did see the Blu-ray news or whatever, and it it led me to to wonder, in general, and not just about Star Wars, about everything, but how we maybe we give way too much credence to shouty voices on the internet. And I know that's not an original thought, but you really wonder how, how controversial is The Last Jedi Doesn't versus... Seem like it. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's selling really well, which means it's re- repeat viewing, and it did really well at the box office. So maybe a lot of the hellabaloo really wasn't about anything at all. And and that brings was, up another about question... about Rotten Tomato score. You know, yeah. I mean, really, that's what gave it... Fuel. And that and that brings up another point. Like, did this help Disney in some ways? Did this make people more committed to want to buy this Blu-ray, be bigger defenders of it than they probably would have been if no one had, if everyone had liked it? Uh, it sure seems in, in these culture wars. It sure seems like that has the the opposite effect. I mean, you look at what Nike is currently going through with the whole Co- Colin Kaepernick situation, and while shares of Nike dropped three percent immediately, they had a thirty one percent increase in one day of internet sales um after they they came up with that thing so i I mean there is some there is some truth to i think what you're saying is nike's not stupid uh they're they're not a stupid marketing department they knew exactly what they were doing and it's working exactly how they wanted it to right but also i think that with nike you have the president of the united states talking about issues relevant to everybody involved in that with the last jedi i don't think really anybody outside of a very small community really, really cared one way or the other about what was going on. And I think obviously because we're doing a Star Wars podcast, because we're plugged in, these things seem a lot more relevant to us than they did at the broader culture. I mean, I guarantee you if we brought it up to our mom tomorrow, she would have no idea that any of this occurred. Um, But she would certainly know that there was a Star Wars movie out. So I I think it's us making a big deal out of something that almost nobody else cares about outside of this little community. Um, as far as Solo goes... Um, you I know, do... I was going to say that you guys had successfully turned it away from what I wanted to talk about, so I was going to give you credit, but I appreciate you at least patronizing me a little bit, Mark, and, uh, and, and touching on Solo. Hey, patronizing you has been what I've been doing for the last 20 years. <laughs> as far as Solo goes, I didn't see it in the theater. I don't buy blu-rays or dvds or anything really i don't even tend to buy movies on amazon or streaming later Uh, not because i have any particular objection to watching it just because it's probably going to be perennially about nine or ten on my list of things to watch and by the time i get down to it being up there then new things are going to be released that i haven't seen and so i i might luck into seeing it at some point, but I have absolutely no plans, um, especially given that it got, you know, okay reviews, but it doesn't seem to be particularly relevant to things I need to see going forward. I just love the movie, and that was one of those things, you know, we, we talk a lot about art being uh, completely subjective, and this was a movie that I just adored, and so that's why you know, I want to talk about it tonight. So thank you guys so much. I think we should probably move I on. I also oh, have two rules yeah. when it comes to popular culture. One, you do not cover all along the Watchtower because Jimi <laughs> Hendrix did it better than anybody's ever going to. And two, you don't recast a Harrison Ford role. Yeah, I don't know. I, I, like, how, I like how Aaron Wright did I don't think... The, the, he, I would say, he, being someone who doesn't love the movie, he is not the problem that I have with the movie. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it's you know, it doesn't matter. It's principle. Yeah, Han, Han, Han Solo and Indiana Jones are just not ones that I think are ever. Everyone's always going to stare at those and, and be like, "You're not Harrison Ford," um, and you're always going to have you against that. Now, Jack Ryan, who who really cares. Um, despite Amazon's attempts to desperately make us care with constant medium bombardments. Yeah, Han Solo is a hard, hard role to walk into. Uh, one other thing that I wanted to ask you guys, um, and this is off topic, but coming back to Ryan Johnson, I mean, the idea of a murder mystery with Ryan Johnson at the helm and Daniel Craig starring, that's something that I kind of liked. I want to get your guys' thoughts on that. I forgot to mention that before, but like, 
you guys into that? Is uh, that it's something that it doesn't seem like he's done before, with the exception of Brick. I don't know. You know well, I mean, he know. hasn't he hasn't made that many movies. Mm-hmm. Um, but but Brick is a a mis- a murder mystery. Right. Um, I, this is going to be a completely different style, I'm imagining, because Brick is a you know a, a 30s noir kind of remake, uh, set in a different environment. But I, I'm I've said many times on here, I'm a big fan of Ryan Johnson. I haven't seen Brothers Bloom, but I've seen all his other movies and some of the TV shows episodes he's done, and I've loved everything. So he's he's someone that I will give the benefit of a doubt the benefit of the doubt to for a, a long time until he he makes Interstellar and proves me wrong. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm a fan of what he's done up until this point that I've seen. I'm I'm not generally a big mystery fan to begin with because I'm of the opinion that why would you read about fictional mysteries when there are so many real world ones that are interesting and take up my time. So I don't plan on seeing it as of right now. Now if it comes out and it gets really good reviews and maybe some Oscar buzz, then I might be more inclined, but as of right now, it's just one of those things that I could take or leave. I could see him being one of those directors that that people that vote for Oscars love and now want to pump up more, too. So I could see that playing to his benefit. It could be. All right, speaking of benefits, let's get to uh, the, the big benefit for mankind. It's going to be the am I right or am I wrong, because it's time... For Tim Laudner and Gary Gaetti's favorite game show, here's how that two-player team, or two-player game works: seven questions, and uh, one of us can go first, and the other will go second, and then we kind of go like a serpentine style. Um, at the end of each question, the point goes to whoever's correct, or if their answers are similar, whichever one the moderator likes better. If there's a draw, there's a draw. No overtime. You need to win it in regulation. We've been building to this match for the past few weeks. Both Mark Neitzel and I have been in training for this very moment. The gloves haven't been off at least since 1999 during the pledge paddle incident, which unfortunately only is able to be described on our super sacred Patreon, our X-rated version of the show. If I'm going against Mark, that means Luke is hosting. So we're going to turn it over to him so that he can take the reins and I can slap myself over and over to prepare. All right. Well, let's, uh, let's, you are slapping yourself. Oh, hold on one second too. Did I ever actually paddle you? I remember paddling rounds. We can't talk. We can't. We can't talk about that. Um, We can't talk about that. Yeah. (laughs) What goes on at Brothers Christmas stays at Brothers Christmas. I'm genuinely curious because I may have smoked away those brain cells. No, I I seriously just made that up just for entertainment. (laughs) So, anyways, moving on. I did write some questions. I've been scouring pop culture for a week, but if you guys want to talk about paddling each other, we could start a new podcast. That would probably get more listens. But uh, we'll, we'll just jump into question one, because I can't think of an, a way to segue this in any smooth fashion. But we, we make a podcast. We are obviously podcast fans. We all listen to a lot of podcasts. And the biggest podcast news there is came out this last week that Serial is finally returning uh, in the next few weeks for a long overdue season three. And the format's going to change on this one. It's not going to follow a single case. It's going to follow a single courthouse. So you're going to get multiple cases and multiple lawyers uh, in, a, in a new way of approaching it, which I think is good, uh, rather than just taking on a single case. So in honor of the return of Serial, we're going to do something a little different. We're going to play a game of categories. Okay, and what that means is is I'm going to list a category, or give a category, and you guys are going to have to list things off that category back and forth until one of you can't do it. All right? Oh, God, this is the worst thing. Mm. Is this for all seven questions? No. Okay. Not all seven. Thank you. Just a couple. God. So we're going to stick with the... We're going to lose this already. We're going to stick with the theme of courtroom. You never know. If you get a good category for you, you might go. So we're going to stick with the, the theme of courtroom drama. And we're going to work with the greatest courtroom drama by naming season one cast members of classic TV show L.A. Law. (laughs) (laughs) So, Mark, we're going to start with you. Can you name me someone off the... And these are... I I will clarify to make this a little harder. These are actors that appeared in the pilot episode. uh, So I'm just going to throw it out there. Blair Underwood does not qualify right now. Okay, so Mark, I'm going to throw this to you. Please give me someone off season one of L.A. Law. I'll I'll even not take the easy ones right away just to give you an advantage here. I will go Alan Rachins as Douglas Brackman. Oh, loved him in Showgirls and 
the best episode of Tales from the Crypt where he switches his wife's head with the cable repairman. Mm-hmm. Alan Ratchins is correct. We are now going to turn it over to Maya Madrid, season one cast members, L.A. Law, fire away. I- Angie Harmon? Oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, just, uh, Mark's going to get the point on that one. We could have gone Harry Hamlin, Corbin Bernstein. Oh, I did know Harry Hamlin. I screwed that up. Jimmy Smits. Jill, Day. Jill Eikenberry. I didn't know Jimmy Smith was on uh, it. Art. Interestingly enough, in the pilot episode, you also have Joey Pants and Elfrey Woodard. So, Ooh, yeah. I was not aware of that. Yeah. Oh, you'd know, you'd know uh, Joey Pants if you saw him. Maybe. All right, so we're going to stick with categories, but we're going to switch the topics this time. So, The Love of My Life, Donald Glover released uh, his first video since his critical cultural smash, This is America. Um, this is an artist so beloved that he was once described on this podcast by Maya as, what has he ever done? Oh, God. <laughs> but his new video is an, let stuff go. A new video is an animated video for the song Feels Like Summer, and it shows an animated childish Gambino walking the streets and showing the images of several hip-hop and political celebrities. So we, we all like music, and I think the three of us would say that our heyday was the 1990s. So I'm going to pick a classic album from the 90s, and I'm going to have you both name songs off that album. And we're going to start with Maya this time, and we are going to go back to February of 1994, and the album, of course, is Crooked Rain, Crooked Rain by Pavement. So, Mr. Maya. Would you like them in order? (laughs) Oh, well, you can only name one, because then Mark's got to go. Why don't we leave the PTI theme song to him? But start us out. Well, let me tell you, Luke, uh, one time that uh, in 1998, I wrote a paper entitled it that stole the name from one of the songs. The name of that was uh, Elevate Me Later. Nice. Track two. Track two. Yeah. Well done. Mark, It's you, in your the ball's in your court, so uh, get, give us another song off Crooked Rain, Crooked Rain by Pavement. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not up on my pavement, so I'm going to have to say... Um, I'm not sure if this is off Crooked Rain. Crooked so, Rain. Totally Googling um, right now. Newark Wilder? What? Newark Wilder, yeah. It's like Newark season. Wilder? Ah, uh oh. Okay. How about Fillmore Drive, being from Fillmore? Uh, I will accept that. Mm. Okay, so it's to me? Yep. Five, um, four, three. Oh, oh. Two. Cut your hair? Yep. Stop breathing? Yep. Heaven is a truck? Yep. Sounds good. Um, okay, I'm kind of feeling guilty now. I actually have the list pulled up right here, so I'm just going to not look at it and, and concede this point. All right. Good. Because it's almost like those two questions didn't matter, and now we can start the real game. Because <laughs> they were so horribly stacked in each one of your favors. I was, did you like L.A. Law, Mark? I, um, I never watched it. It was always on when Saturday Night Live. I, did. I mean, I watched night. a lot, and for whatever reason, I have some weird little brain thing that means i know the cast you know i can't remember what i did last week what i'm supposed to do at work tomorrow but i can pretty much name off all of that cast was that the show that they would play instead of saturday night main event no okay no there was this a show was that on thursday main nights nine o'clock after okay. the musty tv comedy block of course obviously all right so let, let, let's jump into maybe a question that's a little a little more uh, weighted in in both your your favorite. So we're going to go to question three. This is going to be Mark who starts on this one. Uh, the Guardians of the Galaxy drama is kind of never ending at this point. We seem to have an answer to the question of if James Gunn is coming back, which is a resounding no from Disney. But are the Guardians even coming back at all? We don't know at this point. The movie's put been put on hold indefinitely. And actor Dave Bautista has been really uncompromising in his criticism of the mouse. And he's even going on so far as to say lately he doesn't care if they fire him. And it almost seems at this point like he's campaigning to be fired from it. So much like Maya and I discussed with James Gunn, I think the worlds of DC has to be paying attention to this Batista situation. So much like we, we earlier asked about James Gunn, what DC character would you like to see Dave Batista take over? Hmm. DC character, well, I'm going to have to pull from my vast knowledge of Batman villains because I'm pretty sure I don't know. I'm going to say, um, no, I've got it, Atrocious, the Red Lantern, because who doesn't want to see Dave Bautista throwing up red power all over everybody? I think that's right. not a bad not a bad answer. I'm going to go with kind of an oldie but a goodie. 
I would like him to be Solomon Grundy. I think that's a classic character that's never been shown on the screen. And, um, you know, it, it, it's, it'd be something different, so it's not just him redoing Drax. It'd be something uh, a little bit more subdued, and I think he could be scary, and I think he'd be a perfect fit. So, the correct answer was he should be Alan Moore's Swamp Thing. Oh, shit. That, Ooh, that is the right answer. That, that would have been amazing. But I'm going to give the points to Maya because I think Solomon Grundy is a character we need to see on the screen first. I'm not even 100% sure they can do lanterns correctly. Yes, so uh, point point to, to Maya, but those are both good answers. So let's switch to the most important topic that we ever deal with, which is Major League Soccer. The first team in Major League Soccer history, the Columbus Crew SC, are on the verge of moving to Austin, Texas. Ownership released stadium renderings for, for Austin, and they've unveiled their neon green, neon green tree logo <laughs> and a horrifically bland Austin FC name. Now, regardless of what you think about relocation in general, what does the loss of the Columbus market mean to MLS and U.S. soccer? And this is going to go to Maya first. It loses some of its nostalgia for being first. As far as what soccer is going to be in the future or uh, total attendance or anything like that, like Columbus is, is, a, is, a, is a growing market, but at the same time, like it's not... It's not like the hotbed and you have like things like Cincinnati has a big pull and um, it's just not, it's not going to be that big of a deal other than being, it was the first team to have the soccer specific stadium. It's got those, you know, the great crest of like the YMCA dudes um, on it, but it's, I mean, it's not, it sucks and it sucks for the people of Columbus, but it's not a huge deal overall in the grand scheme of things. Mark. I'm going to take a different tact, and I am going to say that this is the start of a chain of events that will lead to Don Garber being outed as the MLS commissioner, because I think uh, not only has he been there a long time, and he's done about what he can with his business model, which is constantly add new teams and have their um, franchise fees as a way to recoup losses for other teams, but I think he's also going to engender enough ill will with the fan base and with certain higher ups in the league that eventually this is going to lead to the league reassessing him as commissioner and saying, you know, you were great for what we needed for these past 10, 15 years, but it's time we got somebody with a new vision of how to make existing teams more profitable as opposed to just, just constant shuffling and adding of new teams so i think it's going to be a big deal but you're not going to see it right away wow so you you both went in directions that i wasn't anticipating and don't necessarily agree with so for me i think what both of you missed out that is really important is is that i think this really really sucks for u.s soccer because columbus was our established home base when we needed a win we put that game in columbus it's the home of dosa zero it, it, it was the place the national team went constantly, and we're losing that. We're losing the, the first ever stadium, soccer-specific stadium in the U.S. Um, you know, I, I was, it, it, it reminds me of what Bethlehem Steel probably could have been all those years ago and, and never got a chance because soccer didn't have a foothold. And now that soccer has a foothold, I'm really disappointed in it. So I am I'm going to I, – I do think you both have very valid points – uh, I, I don't think Columbus has been do, well. Columbus hasn't been a doing a good job of going to the games for one, uh, which is always going to put you in danger. And you have an old stadium, and we know that old stadiums put you in danger unless your owners are super rich. So I, I see Maya's point there, and I see Mark's point too that they have to have some type of plan about what to do post expansion fees, and I'm not sure that they do. Um, but I'm, I'm going to give the point to Mark based solely on the fact that I think it's a bigger deal than probably both of you do. That's fair. And I think Mark's point actually is really good because I've caught myself thinking like, wow, the plan here is just to expand, expand, expand. And so I, I got no problem losing that point. One thing I, I did want to say, however, uh, when it comes to um, – <clears throat> Crap, now I can't, refer, I can't remember. I hope you added The U.S. Yourself. national team? Yeah, the, oh yeah, the U.S. national team with Columbus being the hotbed and be, or being like the home base, I don't think it should be that way. I think it should be either um, Denver, if we need to get a win and can outlast somebody physically at that altitude, or it should be Washington, D.C. 
I think that. I also be. think too that we abandoned Columbus as the spiritual home when we decided to put the uh, National uh, Hall of Fame in Frisco, Texas. Ooh, yeah that that I was forget. that was a an odd choice. Another stadium nobody goes to. The only thing I would disagree with you, Maya, is that part of the reason Columbus became that home is because it was a place where U.S. supporters actually outweighed opposing CONCACAF teams, Mm -hmm. which wasn't happening in Denver and was definitely not happening in D.C., and it was in Columbus. Um, And obviously the U.S. team's gotten more popular, but we still need to be weary of the fact that when we play at home in a big, important game, there should be more U.S. fans than other teams. Um, And as... As a massive Chicago Fire fan, I'm just going to throw in there that to lose our biggest, and I would say at this stage, only mm-hmm. real rival yeah. because of a, a shitty, selfish owner moving to an oversaturated state that doesn't support the teams it has right now really, really sucks. So I really want to save the crew and continue many years of hating them in Columbus. So we are tied 2-2. Two to two. And uh, we're going to move into uh, Mark's absolute favorite topic, so he probably has an unfair advantage. But we're going to talk a little bit of uh, celebrity shaming news. Former Cosby Show cast member Jeffrey Owens was made the target of ridicule by the Daily Mail when it it published pictures of him working a job to support his family as a cashier at Trader Joe's. Now, luckily, Twitter and the internet proved they don't always have to be the worst place in the world, because... Hundreds upon thousands of people jump to his defense that he's working a job. There's no shame in that. Um, and he even was able to uh, turn that into a 10-part uh, series arc on a Tyler Perry show on Oprah's network uh, that I personally had never heard of, but appears to be the highest rated show on the Oprah network. So so good for some good coming out of such a dickish move by the Daily Mail. But you know what? Speaking of jobs, gentlemen, what is the worst job you have ever had? And we start with Maya. Well, the first thing I want to say about that um, is I actually looked into it a little bit, and I was concerned because not only was he, um, you know, not in acting anymore, he also has a degree from Yale, and um, so I'm kind of wondering, like, why why has he not been able to get a job? I don't know what he went to school for. It might have been performing arts or something like that, but um, I was happy, too. Like, somebody, like, gave him $25,000, so that, uh, I think it was Ariana Grande, so... Um, that, that dude was awesome on that show. Now, obviously, the Cosby show, we probably don't want to deal with it anymore because there's so many bad things. But to get back to your question, um, the worst job that I ever had was uh, telemarketing at, in La Crosse, Wisconsin, and um, being sexually harassed over and over again um, on inbound telemarketing calls because they know that you can't hang up. You know, they just call in, and then they just over and over and over. And with my... As uh, as one person put it, with my lazy surfer bo- voice, wow. apparently I, I got that a lot. So they came to me. Wow. Uh, well, my worst job ever wasn't actually that the job itself was bad, but it's the situation, and it actually is relevant to what you brought up. Because in 2009, I lost my job, and this was during the height of the Great Recession in that period when everybody was losing their jobs. And I couldn't find work for a year and a half. I wound up having to go back to school just because I couldn't find a job. And while I was in school, I had a side job where I demoed kitchen appliances at Macy's and, um, you know, Bed Bath & Beyond and all of, you know, those sort of places where I would go and set up a booth during, they would have, you know, bridal registry parties. And I would have to demo how to use this blender, how to use this brand new nonstick skillet. And the job itself wasn't that bad, but it really, I had to learn a lot about humility and about not thinking of myself as being above a job because I needed one and I I had to take it. And so it was kind of a similar circumstance to him that sometimes you do what you have to do to pay the bills. And having to deal with that and having to kind of, you know, confront myself and my ideas about myself was actually pretty difficult for a while there. So um, in that respect, that was the worst job I ever had. Okay, well, so I'm going to have to give the point here to Maya for a couple of reasons. First off is it seems like you actually got a lot of redeeming benefit out of your job, Mark, where Maya just got 
you know, felt up by, or, you know, vocally felt up by creepy people. Um, and also, part of the reason you lose the point is that you got to keep some of that demo equipment, and your wife has made me some of the most amazing mochas off of it. That so, true. in the end, that job was very worth it for me. So, <laughs> I'm going to give... True. Oh, and, and just in case my former boss, Tina, is listening, um, no, I actually didn't have that... Um, I did send it on to the next demo rep, so you can ignore what Luke just said. Yes, exactly, Tina. Yeah, Tina. Question She's six. Star Wars fan, I'm sure. The the pressure is on now for Mark because Maya has a lead with two questions to go. Maya only needs one more to challenge for the title next week. Entertain question six. Entertainment Weekly recently released a first look at the upcoming Captain Marvel movie, which will be the next MCU that'll come out in March. It stars Oscar winner Brie Larson, and she's donning the classic blue, red, and gold costume. Now, we've been having superhero movies be a major part of our life for almost two decades now at this stage. What is the best comic book costume that was adapted for a movie? And we are starting this time with Mark. I am going to go with Captain America because they somehow managed to incorporate those silly little wings on his head without making it absolutely ridiculous. You need to clarify which movie. Uh, well, you can take... Uh, uh, fine, I'll go Civil War. Okay. But any of them really will work as long as they've got the painted wings. Because that was something I had no idea how they were going to do, but I knew they had to include it, and it actually worked. A couple different things. And this is going to be kind of complex because I'd like to address this answer and debate in high school. We would call this a turn. So, um, first things first, I want to, and, and I know that this is probably going to lose me the point, but I just, for clarification purposes, um, the Captain Marvel uniform that she has is not classic. It's brand new, and it's brand new because it's a huge upgrade over the demeaning classic costume that she had. So I just want to get that out there. The second thing I'd like to say... Mark, what's the point? We're moving on. No, go ahead. <laughs> uh, the second thing I'd like to say is that um, not only is uh, is the, the is Mark's answer incorrect because they had to switch it every time, but also the best Captain America one is the dark one from Captain America Winter Soldier, and the second best one is from the original one. So he's he's got that uh, going against him. You know that since he had four different outfits that they've never really gotten it right. Um, but for me, I think the uh, the Ben Affleck Batman was exactly out of the movie and it's what everybody wanted to see and you know it, granted it was a terrible movie but um it was i, I love that that outfit because it's it's true to the comics wow wow you went with ben affleck batman it's a great it's a great uniform i have written down ben affleck and batman versus superman <laughs> wow yes i really did not think anyone would guess that but i 100 percent agree it's with great. you it's, it's amazing it's, it's, yeah. it's it's right out of the comics so and i and i prefer my batman with really long ears but the fact of the matter is the way that they made the look from um the dark knight returns into a real life thing it was just it was flawless it was beautiful yeah no it's that's perfect shit that's, that's complete bullshit uh, uh and he's right if you see the captain i was waiting for you to pick the avengers the first avengers movie mark for your Captain America because that thing is embarrassingly bad when you watch it but the Civil War one is very good so Maya has one but we will do question 7 anyway just to humor me a new video game is taking the world by storm it is Spider-Man on yes. PS4 and it's drawing rave reviews from critics and consumers gentlemen what's your favorite video game of all time and we start with Maya well, I mean, first of all, I want to say about Spider-Man, I'm so excited. Did you see that, like, there's a there's a way that you can, like, push a button, and then he just finger guns people, like, on Oh, wow. Screen. Like, it's so perfect. It's so Spider-Man. You know how much I like Spider-Man. My favorite game is the game that I've played more than any other game. It's a series of games, and it's the NCAA football game. That is the game that, that you guys both watched, how into that game I got, that I was willing to sit next to... to to uh, Angry Pete for as long as I did, and I just loved like the recruiting aspect, plus it's football, so that, that was my favorite game. FIFA is, is a close second for me. All right, Mark, what was yours? Up, down, up, down, left, right, <laughs> left, right, A, B, A, B. Come on, how can you not love a game that has a cheat code that basically allows you to win? The original Contra, still the best. That, that's pretty good. If this, if this point mattered, I would give it to Mark, but I, I wrote down Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, the arcade game, which... It was an awesome game. That was pretty sweet. So, looks like I'll be taking on Maya next week. I'm so Ugh. excited. I'd like to thank my family. I'd like to thank all the people that helped me out to get to this point. Um, it's hard fought. 
and there were so many people along the way that helped me out. Don't, I'm really excited don't to go for the title. Don't get to fake crappy DC movies that Mark doesn't even bother to see. <laughs> it's still a good costume. Hey, uh, maybe you're out there. Martha. Feeling lonely. Maybe you like the sound of Mark's smooth voice, or perhaps the smug attitude of his taller brother. Maybe you're drawn to this lazy surfer aesthetics of my voice. Maybe you just need someone to talk to. In the words of John Lennon, if you're lonely, you can talk to me. Email the show. Tweet the show. Immerse yourself in the show. Javier from SoCal in our questions that kids seriously got. He writes, you guys are a good way into season two now. What do you like better so far? Season one or season two? Go ahead, Mark. Um, well, first off, I like anything that doesn't have stupid ass Ben Affleck playing Batman in it. Um, <laughs> I actually haven't even seen season two or season one, I should say. Um, I, I started this little project on season two. So, uh, I guess by default, I like season two. That was a more nuanced answer that I thought you were going to give. I thought you were just going to be like, fuck off. I haven't seen season one. Um, I'm also going to go with season two, though they've both been chaotic and up and down. The things I've probably liked so far, I think they have a higher batting average in season two than they did in season one. Uh, but the worst episode they've had overall is in season two. So it, it, it certainly hasn't been perfect. We, we've both heard a lot of the, oh, it gets better in season two. I'm still waiting for it to get really good. So I'm wondering if that's going to happen in season two or where we're kind of going in, in that direction. But I would definitely, I would definitely, if someone was coming to me right now and being like, where should I start? I would just have them, I would have them start at the very end where Cad Bane is introduced in season one and then just go into season two and just skip most of what came before. I think I liked a lot of season one and I liked how like self-contained episodes seem to have a lot of, uh, a lot of interesting themes. Uh, but for me, season two, whether you're lo- if you're somebody who likes fight scenes, if you're somebody who likes visuals, or if you're somebody who likes longer uh, storylines, season two is definitely in. And I think the highest of the highs have been much better in season two, so I go season two. Hey, so uh, we should probably all this talk about season two. We should probably get to it, huh? Yeah. Season two, episode eight, Brain Invaders. Attachment is not compassion. What the hell does that even mean? Nothing. Okay. It means nothing. <laughs> Written by Andrew Kreisberg and directed by Stuart Lee, this is the Clone Wars getting their zombies on as a strange organism begins to affect the Republic through mind control. By the way, before we start, can I just say that when I saw that tagline, attachment is not compassion, I my first thought was, oh, did they write that for people on Twitter bitching about Last Jedi? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's pretty good. <laughs> Uh, first off, I'm going to ask before we jump right in. Maya, did you go back and watch because you weren't with us? Did you watch the episode that preceded this? No, because you guys hated it so much and I okay. just limited on time today. I okay. It. So these were introduced. Hey, but you listen to the show, so that's yeah, good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so the brainworms were introduced in the last episode and we start out here kind of wrapping up with the narration of what happened in the last episode. The Battle of Geonosis is done. They've recaptured it and the Jedi are taking Poggle the Lesser to Coruscant for trial. Now, they need to bring him there, but Mace Windu also needs supplies in some other system that's far off because he's taken heavy losses. So there's a big group of Jedi here. We have Kiati's back, Luminara, Anakin, Obi-Wan, and then also... Kit Fisto at the end. Yeah, well, Kit Fisto, oh, yeah, yeah, he's at a different location. But yeah. And then Ahsoka and Barriss, the two Padawans, have returned as well. So they decide that they're going to send the two Padawans, Ahsoka and Barriss, with the clones to get medical supplies for Mace while the rest of them take Poggle back to Coruscant. Then we go to a cave, we see a brain worm hatch out of its eggs and go straight up the nose of a clone. And uh, that clone is obviously then taken over and they are... It sounds like a... a, a, What is that? That rockumentary on VH1 but just sounds like... Right up the nose of the rock star. <laughs> exactly. Hey, Luke. Yeah. Luke, uh, I don't recall. The last podcast we did, did one of us predict that the brainworms were going to get on the ship by infecting the trooper? It, it was an impressive prediction. I uh, <laughs> Nostradamus hasn't got shit on you, my friend. Um, so, yeah, you just as you called it, and, and he is then told, hey, you have to go join all the other clones, and he, he comes to life. He comes to life kind of in a... 
in an exorcist, you know, limb breaking kind of way, which I enjoyed. And he, he goes and, and jumps on the plane with all the other ones. And we see in his bag that he has filled it with other brain worm eggs. Uh, we cut to Ahsoka and Barris on this ship. And uh, the, what really struck me is they're sleeping in this corner and they don't get blankets. And I'm not sure what that was about, but it looks miserable to try to sleep in. Space is cold. Uh, that's what Anakin told us. You'd think he would be thinking about that. It's true. Like, there should be... Hey, the comfort of a blanket leads to complacency. Complacency <laughs> leads to the dark side. That's, that's, that's very fair. <laughs> well said. We should make that the tagline of our show. Um, so th- they, they decide to go at breakfast because they can't sleep on their hard mound that they're sleeping on. And the brain worm clone walks into a room full of sleeping clone soldiers and basically just throws the eggs all around. So they hatch and take over all of the clones. And these clones then get up and go to try and kill. Uh, well, first they kill the people on the bridge so that they can take over the the ship. And then they go and try to have a couple go kill Ahsoka and Barriss. So a fight breaks out in the kitchen. And they're able to overwhelm them quickly, which I was happy that the Jedi were able to put that down really quickly. Like, it wasn't a big drawn-out thing, because the clones shouldn't have a chance against them. Um, and then the the Padawans kind of don't know who to trust. Uh, meanwhile, on the other ship, the, the Jedi are debating what to do, since they can't reach the Padawans. And Obi-Wan, in typical Obi-Wan fashion, is like, I'm sure it's fine, who cares? <laughs> And Anakin, in typical Anakin fashion, wants to just, like, run over and kill everything, because something must be wrong. Um, they're also not getting anything out of Poggle at this stage. But um, we, we then we then cut back to them. They don't have much of a story in this one. And the Padawans are, uh, basically, they run into two other, two other clones who they don't think are infected. And, the, you know, they betray them, and, you know, so it, it just plays up more the... Who can you trust? They could be pretending to be brain-controlled worm clones or not. Um, Barris and uh, Ahsoka basically get a hold of Kit Fisto, who is at the medical station they're supposed to be going to, and they warn him of what's coming. And he's like, that's fine, just keep coming. No no worries, we'll handle it. We're the Jedi, it doesn't matter. Even though they, they warn them not to, uh, he, he sticks with it. And Anakin also is able to find out what's going on, and he knows about the brain worms, so... He, he, fre- he freaks out. Barris and Ahsoka decide they have to split up. Barris is going to go and disable the engine so they can't get to Kit Fisto. And, Anna- and this is where Ahsoka is going to go talk to Anakin, which she goes and does. And then uh, Barris is caught by the clones before she can disable and is brainwormed by them. So she is now under control as well. Go ahead. One of my favorite things about this new season is actually the juxtaposition of Ahsoka being, like, this naughty Padawan, or, like, the Padawan, that there's something broken between the relationship between her and Anakin, and then how, like, Barris and um, uh, Luminara, their relationship is so good, and they're doing, like, the Jedi thing, but it always seems like Barris and Luminara are the ones who are, like, faltering, like, it's feeling, like, you're doing all the right things, and it got me thinking a lot about themes, and this is my favorite thing about Season 2, is this whole dynamic between these four characters of, you know doing things the old school way and fitting things in and is that the right and it's it, it almost seems like the more that this goes on the more that the writers and george lucas whatever hand he had in the second season are really questioning what it means to be a jedi and i think it's fascinating yeah i guess my my only counter to that which is a little worrisome in these episodes is that at this stage luminari and barris have been wrong or unable to cope with everything so now to me it's become less about their methods that the two of them might just be incompetent and, they, and uh, that's worrisome to me a little bit. I, could you do me a favor and not refer to the teenager with the bare midriff as the naughty Padawan? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mean it like that. Oh, God. Woof. You're playing right into some of the creep factor there. Yeah. Well, anyway, Barris, a uh, controlled Barris. I don't think of her like that, so I'm sad that you went there. She's not white, so Maya's not into her. No, I'm just kidding. That was terrible. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Do we want to compare? I think, <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I think uh, if, we, if we went down the list... Oh, there you'd be surprised. Anyways, <laughs> she, uh, Barris is brain, brainworm controlled and runs into Ahsoka, and they have a fight, which Ahsoka is basically able to um, escape through the vents. And then we shift back, where Anakin is 
figured out what's happening by talking to Ahsoka, and he's going to find out from Poggle what they can do to stop these worms. And he goes in, he goes in and shows basically his first flashes that I can recall of his Darth Vader side here. Where yes, finally, finally, yeah, and the music even played, and he goes in and he he goes into without telling the other Jedi to interrogate Poggle, and he tries a mind trick, and Poggle kind of laughs at him, and he's like, "Fine, then I'm just gonna choke you to death until you tell me what you want." Uh, and it works, and he gets the info, and he is able to tell Ahsoka that they are resistant to cold, so she destroys the cooling system in there, and as the the worms are starting to be affected by the cold, and also Ahsoka is, she has kind of a last fight with Barriss, and they try to ratchet up the tension of having Barriss kind of regain control of herself for just long enough to tell Ahsoka, hey, you need to kill me, which Ahsoka won't do, and then the worm is kind of half out of Barriss's nose, and Ahsoka then finally strikes, and they kind of cut away, so you can't tell if she killed Barriss or just sliced the worm, but we know. Um, and then she passes we, out from the did cold. We, did we know? We knew. We, we very much knew, just like we knew Cad Bane was that stormtrooper all along. Uh, I don't know if it was that blatant. But uh, Ahsoka, it was Ahsoka wakes up in the medical room with Anakin and asks if she did the, the right thing, and Anakin, in a roundabout way, tells her no and yes at the same time, but basically, no, you did the right thing because you, you followed your, your instincts. Your emotions. Exactly. And then uh, they show that Barris is still alive, and we fade to black, and the episode ends. I liked this episode, and... A couple of things that I liked is that, you know, Ahsoka got information from Anakin, but she was a female character who handled this whole situation on her own. She was able to do it, and she was up to the task, and we haven't had that really much before. And especially with the bad taste we had in our mouth after that horrible, horrible Padme episode a few back, I thought that was a nice touch. Plus, as we mentioned, the the Darth Vader thing is something that this show has been desperately in need of for a long time and we're finally getting to see him do the wrong thing which is what he needs to do even though it's kind of for the right reasons i liked that i enjoyed it i liked the music that went with it and i'm a horror guy and this was very much a horror episode from the way they did they did a jump scare at one point with barris and ahsoka how creepy those monsters were the eggs hatching out and going up all the clones at once and them kind of writhing around uh, you know, this isn't this isn't the greatest episode I've seen, but I I had a good time with this. Mark, what did you think of this one? Um, it was definitely an improvement over last week. Um, and as I said before, with last week's two, while the whole you know brain worms and the zombies was kind of derivative of aliens, at least if you're gonna steal something, steal from good source material. So I was enjoying that. Uh, my biggest complaint with this actually was I thought it was over too quickly. Um, this is a plot point, I think, that they really feels like something that you could build on over multiple story arcs and have kind of a slow burn. But they introduced these brainworms for a real big threat last episode only to just basically get them over with right away. Yeah, and I, I agree with that as well. And one of the things they mention in there is they talk about how the brainworms were probably, it's a toss-away line, but the brainworms were probably the reason that they lost Geonosha in the first place because they win it in Attack of the Clones, and then we have this arc where they don't control it. And I'm sitting there thinking, man, if they use brainworms to take over a whole planet, like, I wish I would have seen that. Yeah, it, it was a, it's a great um, idea that is just full of potential, but it seems... Like, they they not only ended it, but they gave such an easy out for how to beat it. Oh, stick somebody in a freezer for five minutes, and the thing will just pop out of their nose. That it, it diminished it as a threat. So I can't really see them using it going forward, and I just feel like there was a really lost opportunity there to build something. And just kind of disappointing for it to be over so quick. I don't know, Maya, what, what are you with this? So art is subjective, right? Yeah. This is my favorite fucking episode ever. Yeah. And of the entire series and this season. Now, I didn't see the one that you guys saw. So I didn't see, you know, Luke brings up the idea that Luminara is always making mistakes. So I didn't see that. But I love Barris and I love Ahsoka. And I love that dynamic so much. And I love this Anakin. This is the Anakin that I wanted to see. This is the Anakin who does what he wants, who does the right thing, who focuses on emotion. Or everything, it, it, it makes the prequels better. This episode makes the prequels better. I love the visuals. I thought it was scary. I love the themes. I love everything about this episode. Um, 
So yeah, I mean, at the risk of getting flame, like this is my episode. Like Weapons Factory had the starkest moment in the entire series, and that's still my second favorite. When everything blows up again, Barris and Ahsoka. Like I don't know why I'm so attached to these two characters and this dynamic, but I love both of them, and I don't know what's gonna happen to Barris. Maybe maybe I was thinking that she was gonna die because I'm paranoid because I don't I don't think she makes it. I don't know what happens, um, and so I'm just kind of waiting for her to die. But I love this so much between these two characters. This is my favorite episode of the entire series. And you, I'm, I'm certainly not gonna flame you over that. Uh, my gripes aren't even as much with the episode itself. It's just with the lost potential that I yeah. saw. For them to really build something more that it felt like they they kind of let go but the episode itself yeah is fun and entertaining and i completely get why you're, you're coming from with that and my you you mentioned this you've mentioned this previously because you get annoyed with when they reuse things over and over as far as characters and locations and the thing about barris is is that barris is not in any of the movies so there is legitimate tension about what could happen to her, you know? Kiati can get as beat up as we he wants, but we know how he dies in Revenge of the Sith. So when you have more Jedi like Barriss, there is a concern when you get attached to them that they could die. And the one thing that we know for sure is that attachment is not compassion. Should we do other new news? Let's do it. I'm a nerd. We have news for the beautiful people. <laughs> There's a lot more of us in our view. All right, guys, so it's my week, and I think it's probably become clear both to listeners of the show and to you guys that I've become much more interested in American football, again, after the past few, few years, while you guys have been more interested in soccer as a whole. I love soccer. It's my second favorite sport. I love Real Madrid and Chicago Fire, no matter how great or how terrible those teams are. And all three of us have, at one time or another, been season ticket holders to our favorite teams in soccer, and it's something we talk about quite often here on the show because it's something that we all have in common but i was troubled last week and listening as you guys were trying to re replace me um in an offhanded comment mark mentioned that he really doesn't like football that much anymore because of the concussions and at first i sort of shrugged my shoulders i was kind of like yeah that's i hear a lot of that but um i just started to think about it more and more and first um you know i i think i think the, the for both of you your interest in football waned a lot um, before the concussions thing became popular. But second, um, was something that I wanted to talk about with concussions in soccer. You remember that Abby Wambach back in 2016 announced that she would be giving her brain to science after she dies for fear of having CTE. Um, if you've done the research, you often find that, you know, a lot of it's not known, but the people who suffer from CTE, a lot of the research points to sub-concussive hits. And if you've, if you've, like, looked at the people, they've had, like, drugs and other addiction problems, which, which Wambach has. And... It seems like heading a ball is a huge issue. And so as I listen to both you guys, I wanted to get your opinions on, you know, there's all this talk about concussions in football, but we really don't discuss it in soccer. And I wanted to see, you know, if the con if the concussion research comes out in the same way, is soccer going to be something that you guys don't like? What is your guys' opinion on this? So, so first off, what I'll say is that my, my waning interest in the NFL had more to do with moving out of the fandom that... I grew up loving and supporting and moving into a very hostile fandom that made me and my team sucking like that. That obviously kills some of your interest as well. So mine isn't as concussion related. My uh, frustration with the NFL as far as it comes to concussion isn't about the likelihood of what happens to players with concussions. It's about the how actively the NFL works against former players to provide them accurate medical coverage and to deny that there's problems. Um, and, and that's where more my issue comes from than rather the game itself. As for soccer, I think we do a better job in Major League Soccer of trying to take care of our players and working with our players than I think the NFL does. I think European soccer is light years behind where the NFL is. I mean, they have players knocked unconscious still to this day, and they send them back out there because they don't want to use subs. We've, we've seen that multiple times in Europe, and it's it's horrific how little it they... It in the World Cup. Yeah, and, and, and how little that they seem to value head injuries, you know. So I think that that's a major, major problem in soccer that needs to be addressed, and uh, sadly it looks like the U.S. is going to have to be the place where maybe we, we focus on that more and hope the rest of the world takes note. I coach little kids i coach first and second graders and the u.s standard is, is they're not supposed to 
start doing headers till they're like 12 or 13. And one of the things I tell, uh, I did boys previously, but I'm doing girls this season is that I have a, a, a talk with them and I say, what, you know, what part of your body can't you use in, in our league? And they all say their hands. And I say, no, you're not supposed to use your hands, but if you use your head, I'm not going to let you play. And, uh, I would rather we let a goal in than you head the ball. Um, because they're, they're too young and we can't be teaching them how to do that properly until they're of an age where they're older and able to handle that. And I honestly would be all for the, you know, the padded helmets that like players like Peter check wear or Aleko Eskandarian wore that w would give some type of protection for heading. Um, I, I don't have all the answers on what to do with heading, but yeah, I think it's a major problem in soccer and I think they need to come up with some type of solution. Mark, what would you say? I, I agree with what you said. And uh, to build on it, the first time I was on Twitter, I actually had former Tampa Bay Rowdies coach Thomas Ronkin call me numb nuts because I suggested that. Is that the should... first time that's happened or does that happen often? Well, from Thomas Ronkin. <laughs> from, from Thomas Ronkin, yes. From, you know, somebody who's, you know, moderately well known in the soccer community um, because I suggested that we could eliminate heading from soccer altogether, um, which I think is where the sport should go. Um, you treat headers like handballs where, I mean, it's going to be unavoidable that occasionally somebody's going to get hit in the head. It, it's just a risk inherent with being on a field with the ball, but you, you treat it like a handball. Where is it? Um, were you attempting to hit it with your head or was it incidental contact? And um, I agree with what Luke said. I think it is a big problem. I think that, especially in in Europe and in the Asia, it's it's a huge problem. Um, I do think it's not as critical an issue as it is with the NFL right now because I don't think, especially during games, that they're getting hit in the head as much with the level of severity that the offensive linemen in the NFL are. Um, it's just a completely different animal when you're taking sub-concussive hits from a 350-pound linebacker slamming into you 40, linebackers 50 aren't times. Pounds, but duly noted. What? No, I'm just teasing. I said linebackers aren't 350 pounds, but duly noted nonetheless. Whatever you get, what I'm saying here, I'm ripping. Don't even, don't, don't interrupt. Just let me go with it. Um, I, I don't think that the damage being done to soccer players is as severe as it is to NFL players. So there is a higher priority for me to address it in uh, American football than there is in soccer. But as somebody who has been concussed several times on a soccer field, um, and all of the times it happened were because I or somebody else was leading with their head. Um, I absolutely think that it is something that needs to be addressed. I think it's something that eventually should be phased out entirely. And I am believing it strongly enough that I, you know, I support the U.S. Uh, U.S. leagues, um, especially our, our youth leagues, taking drastic action on it, even to the point where that may hurt our chances in the international game going forward. Because at the end of the day, I don't want to trade some 20-year-old kid's life for a quarterfinal berth in the World Cup. Well, all right. There's that. But what about you? I mean, what about me? We've expounded here ad nauseum, but uh, I would like to hear your opinion since you broached the topic. To begin sure. With. So my, my opinion on whether or not there should be a heading in soccer, I would be fine if they took it out. I mean, I, I cheer for Spanish teams. And the <laughs> are had anyways, right? Um, so, uh, you know, but but honestly, I mean, like, I think it would be smart to take it out. I think the, the answer to football is to, to tackle much more like rugby does. Um, you know, uh, Coach Carroll from the Seattle Seahawks has been instrumental in, in changing the way that people tackle um, with more of a rub, rugby style tackling that he calls um, that he calls hawk tackling. Um, and you know, from an offensive line perspective, there's basically two ways to, to play offensive line. You can block with your head as a weapon, or you can block with the hands. Um, and I think if they do a better job all around, just blocking with the hands, you're probably going to get lighter linemen and more athletic linemen. Um, and that's not necessarily a problem because one of the other things that they talk about in the NFL is all those problems that these people get because they put up so much weight when if you were just man mandatory hands blocking as the way to go, you can still be physical and um, actually have much more speed in the athletic game. It's actually much more fun to watch. So 
that's my as, my. As issue. our resident football uh, American expert, um, what do you think about the idea of removing helmets and pads and making them play more in like a rugby outfit? And do you think that that would help as far as teaching safer tackling? Yeah, I think so. Um, I think um, I think that that the 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 great idea of putting helmets on and that was the the idea that that so long ago. Um, and just sort of like bulking up is that players realize you could use that shit as weapons and that's what they've done. And that's how we got to the point that we have. And then you have ESPN and all the networks, um, you know, sensationalizing it and, and you have coaches, but at all levels cheering the big hit with the heads. And then suddenly we have a generation of idiots out there, uh, former football players that, that can't think straight, um, because they've been knocked around too much. And, and, when I was a kid playing football, the rule was you, you, you know, if a guy's coming across your body, you put your head, your, your ear hole on his heart to make them go through your head. I mean, every single tackling technique or every single blocking technique incorporated the head. And that's why my generation and younger are having all these problems. I'll be interested to see, and I'm not saying it's going to solve everything, but this push towards hands blocking and more rugby style tackling, I think could have an effect. Um, and I also, I, I do think that would be interesting if they got rid of pads. Um, the only thing yeah. I'd say about eliminating equipment, because people like to use the rugby example, and I do think that they wrap up better, mm -hmm. but they do such a piss poor job in these countries of even caring or identifying concussions that yeah. I don't think we have accurate information on yeah. how many concussions these rugby players are getting in no helmets because they don't care. Like everyone can look at football and be like, yeah, I get so many concussions, but that's because we're actually taking the time to track concussions that they're not doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that makes sense too. Um, and it's to your point too. It actually, it was a high school game was the reason why I originally started to sour on, on football. Um, you know, despite the fact that I played the Vikings theme song at the, the head of this episode, um, it was, I was watching some friends' kids play and my friend's son laid out some kid on the field. And of course they had a camcorder and they were taping it. And so my friend and the parents, they were cheering and they were replaying the, the scene on the little handheld while the kid is laid out on the field being attended to. And, and that was sort of the first moment where I sort of really saw the violence of American football in a different way. And so that really kind of began the process for me. And I still watch football. I'm still loyal to it. But for me, it's a lot more of the cultural identity of it, of being I'm a Minnesotan. Therefore, I cheer for the Minnesota Vikings. All of my friends, all of my family cheer for the Minnesota Vikings. It was a big part of life. And then to lose that sense of identity uh, was is kind of an ongoing struggle for me. Um, I actually wish I could completely give up football, uh, but I can't because it, it, it's hard. And so that's kind of the ongoing clash. But that may be getting a little further away from your initial question and that's a, that's we're right. getting late. So, Hey guys, well, speaking, yeah. speaking of knocking something out, seems like we're all done here. Mark, the people, where can they find you? Well, actually in a bit of news, Twitter did ban Alex Jones. This they, week. they heard our show. They did. They heard our show. Um, we're reaching listeners. I'm going to thank Kelly Thompson for her, uh, nice like on Twitter as a result of that. So I am on Twitter and the people can reach me. I am Mark Neitzel at Wink Martindale five. Why? Because I'm a big Tic Tac Doe fan. <laughs> Luke. Luke underscore Neitzel. I'm Maya Madrid. Uh, you can find me at Maya Madrid on Twitter. Together we all three are kids seriously. See you next week everyone. Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening to Kids Seriously. If you didn't completely hate us, feel free to hit like, subscribe, or tell a friend about the show. If you want to write to us and tell us how much we suck, or just ask a question, you can reach us at kidsseriouslyradio at gmail.com. Otherwise, hit us up on Twitter at Kids Seriously. Thanks, and we'll see you next time.